May I ask what your definition of philosophy is? The study of ideas. That's, yeah, that's pretty good. Solid. Yeah. Don't ask me what my definition of idea is. <laughs> it's philosophy. I'm rotating this way so I can see Billy. That's fair. And so I don't have to look towards Ethan's direction. God bless you. Your vibes throw me off, man. Making mad uncomfortable. Well, I'm glad I could project my emotions onto you. Sound like every like musician. <laughs> yeah, man. It's just about the vibes, man. Yeah. So speaking of, when it comes to songwriting, how much of trying to force your emotions onto other people do you feel like there should be? I think it might depend on what topic you're writing about. Obviously, love songs are like really digestible, but like political songs are much more like your personal opinion. I know it doesn't fully answer your question. Perhaps it makes it easier to. Yeah, I was gonna say I was seeing if Connor had any other stuff to add because yeah, I mean I don't write songs, so I I don't know. <laughs> I got nothing to say on that. It's all wiggly air. It's all wiggly air. And people are going to take from your song what they what they think they need from it. I won't say what they need from it. That was the most Kafka-esque answer you could have given. <laughs> Is that how you say his name? <laughs> I'm trying to. <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, Billy O'Brien. Hello. Of Hemlock Theory and being Billy O'Brien fame. Yeah. Mm. I do mean myself most of the time. I was an actor in my childhood, though. Mm. That's where I first knew you from. Correct. Billy and I got into a conversation on Instagram about philosophy. You are a fan of the poet and philosopher Rumi. Yeah. And I thought it'd be fun to put those ideas in conversation with Probably my favorite philosopher, at least my favorite pre-modern philosopher, Baruch Spinoza. There are people from different time periods, different regions, different theological backgrounds, but I think there's a uh, advantage to this sort of interdisciplinary, interfaith discourse, putting them in conversation. You're Christian, right? Mm -hmm. Spinoza's Jewish, and Rumi is Sufi, which is a... Uh, not a sect, but like a mode of Islam. And I feel like the Judaism and Islam, using that to triangulate um, some sort of Christian understanding of the world is a, it's a very productive way to go about it. Yeah. Like these Abrahamic faiths, they're all speaking to some sort of understanding of God that the others are necessarily missing. Just, I mean, we can't focus on everything. Like the, the parable of the blind men and the elephants you got one person feeling the leg. He says it's like a tree. One person feeling the trunk. He says it's like a snake. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going on. They all get in fights. But if if you can like accept that what the other person has to say is true, then you can actually figure out what an elephant looks like. And we're just trying to figure out what God looks like. DMT. <laughs> I've seen too many horror stories about what God looks like. Good old biblically accurate angels. Yeah. Yeah, I had not encountered anything about Rumi before talking hey. to you. Okay, hell yeah. Glad to show you. I mean, a lot of the overlap with Spinoza's ideas is what got me excited because they both have an understanding of God not as like transcendent outside the world, but as imminent, as something that like is nature, is part of nature. I love Spinoza's takes on, on nature. God is limitless power. I mean, you have to understand that as nature in its infinite unfolding. They've got sort of an overlap in like the path to God is by knowing, knowing nature, knowing yourself and understanding that you are not distinct from God. A lot of the things I was learning about Sufism and Rumi was about trying to attain a state of, of ego death, mm -hmm. of ego dissolution. I also hear them both described as intoxicated with God, with nature, and with love. That checks out with Rumi, at least. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Spinoza's, I mean, a lot more mathematical in his writing, but in his life, that's sort of the same idea. Towards the end of the ethics, it's like you shouldn't be trying to just be reserved all the time. You shouldn't cut yourself off from the world. It's like against asceticism because God is in the world. God is in your experiences. And if you orient yourself towards this kind of knowledge, that's how you pursue it. Be passionate. The other thing that caught my attention was Rumi is a love poet. Yeah. But in a very metaphysical sense of love. Like you can 
love a thing or a person, but he seems to be more taking on the idea of love, which is fundamentally always love of God, because God is imminent in nature. And this is sort of Spinoza's take too. He defines love as the feeling of joy, feeling of being empowered, but with an object that you attribute to be the cause of joy. He's also a determinist. He doesn't believe in free will or agency. I mean, God is the infinite unfolding of the universe. There's no room for human agency because it's only God. It's only his infinite power. And there's no effects without causes. That's the Einstein quote, God doesn't play dice. Anything that happens is something that had to have happened. There's a strict causal chain running from the beginning of the universe to the end of it. And for Spinoza, knowledge is to understand this chain of causation, knowing its causes and knowing its effects. The interesting contradiction is that because to love something is to imagine that it's the cause of your joy, then to know that thing is to understand that the thing itself isn't causing your joy because there are things that caused the thing. And ultimately your joy traces back to this infinite regression to the beginning of the universe. You can no longer imagine that a single thing is the cause of joy. It's always caused by something prior, like I love my partner, but if I really know my partner, I know that she's been shaped by the circumstances that she came out of. I can ultimately trace back causes of aspects of her personality that I love. What I actually love is the circumstances behind my partner. And ultimately, I love the circumstances behind those circumstances. And you trace back all these causes to the beginning of the universe, which is why Spinoza says that the only true love is love of God, or like love of fate, love of the process of nature that's a hot take dang it <laughs> i was having fun over here until that <laughs> yeah <laughs> but i have a lot of thoughts <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't currently but i'm going to like laying in bed tonight that's fair i mean that's the most like direct way to depict of like yeah god everything had to happen so if you love the entire process of everything in the universe that led to one point. God's the everything that led to that one point at the end of the day. Therefore, like, are you going to appreciate every single step, but you don't even know every single step? And if, as you were saying, God is everything, then yeah, just appreciation for everything would turn to that. You got me tripped out, man. This all came from Instagram DMs. <laughs> This is why I'm off a lot. She won't help us on the DMs. <laughs>Does Spinoza have any takes on art and music in the way that Rumi has? Not specifically, which is the other reason I really wanted to have this conversation. Because, I mean, Spinoza has been really influential for how I think about music. Specifically, if God is imminent in nature. And the way to reach God is through this knowledge, through this dissolution of the ego and accepting this like cause effect process. One way I feel that is through music as a de-individuating force, loud, intense music, metal concerts, but also worship music is the same thing. Mm -hmm. You're letting music overpower you. It's like a weighted blanket. That's exactly it. <laughs> it's why I get in fights with people at church about the music needs to be loud. If old people complain, then they don't know God. <laughs> they heard about him but never met him exactly you want to meet god it's going to be scary it's going to be intense you need to let go of all these things that you've been trained to understand about yourself as distinct a lot of what society is built around is getting us away from god because i mean the pure experience of god is lethal that's kind of how the bible frames it you need to go through a cleansing process to even enter the temple so it it is scary but music, it's sound shaking you internally. It's interrupting the distinction between outside and inside. And you really do feel yourself become part of pure substance, part of God in that moment. Yeah. What does Rumi have to say about that? You basically just summed up what Rumi also says, like... Yeah. Because <laughs> I know in Sufism and in the sects, that he inspired there's a practice of sama mm -hmm. i think that's how it's pronounced but it translates to something like listening this is why i was asking about whirling dervishes yeah i, was, I remember you were talking about that and then rumi's largely responsible for not responsible but 
influential in that department. Yeah. That's so cool. It's the um, dances that involve very large skirts. Yeah. A form of meditation and dance where you're like, I mean, spinning, whirling, but it's an active thing. You, you want to feel yourself as a process, yeah. as part of the clockwork god. Spiritual movement. Exactly. I think there needs to be more physical worship in the world. Oh, absolutely. People need to move more in general. Yeah. Honestly. I know the whole like standing up, like, please stand. But like, that's, I feel like the weakest way you can say it. I'm talking like, all right, y'all run a lap around the church for God and then run or like, let's do these monkey bars to, I don't know. We do in calisthenics with Jesus. Exactly. Acrobatics for the Lord. Exactly. Dual flute. That's like all the Mormon jump ropers. <laughs>